and I'm going to turn it over to Doug Hoverson, who uh, is a historian, beer historian and author, um, has written books about Wisconsin beer history and Minnesota beer history and more on the way. Um, and I'm excited for this talk because I know nothing about what's going on in Minnesota uh, beer wise in the past. So um, let's listen to Doug. Doug, thanks so much for being here uh, and doing this for us. Well, thanks, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome to all of you from all over the world. And I'm going to do a little bit of a encapsulation of my book, The Land of Amber Waters, The History of Brewing in Minnesota. And I'm about to, if I remember the sequence, get the sharing. All right, Liz, does this look like it's supposed to? All right. Yep. Uh, looks great, looks great. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Um, my day job is high school history teacher and I spend a lot of time insisting that when my students are writing that they have a thesis. So I feel duty bound to model that sort of behavior here and actually have a thesis about the brewing industry in Minnesota. And what I'm gonna claim is that brewing in Minnesota is not so much important because it was exceptional, but really because it was as typical a state as you could possibly have. It had a little bit of something of everything. It had the small breweries, it had the large breweries, it was home to some scientific innovations, it was in many cases a follower of a state, it, wasn't that innovative in a lot of ways, but it capitalized on many of the trends in America's brewing industry better than most. And I think you'd find few states that have so many different aspects of brewing as Minnesota. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about where the idea for this book came. And it was almost accidental. I was working on my master's paper on the Northern Pacific Railroad in Northern Minnesota and came across this advertisement in an 1882 Moorhead, Minnesota newspaper. And at first I was fascinated because I was realizing that at this point, the city of Fargo wasn't even in North Dakota, it was in what was still Dakota territory. And not only that, the Northwestern Bottling Company had a telephone connection in Fargo only a few years after the telephone had been invented. But then I kept looking and noticed that John Erickson ran the Moorhead Brewery. And at this point in my studies of history, I really had no idea I was going to be writing about beer. And I didn't know that Moorhead had a brewery. I had familiarity with just the three big ones and two small ones in recent Minnesota history, all of which will be mentioned shortly. And, you know, who knew Moorhead had a brewery? Well, my question, who knew, became of increasing interest. So who did know? I started looking around for books on the topic and discovered that there really weren't any. There were a couple of guides for beer can collectors. There was a geography PhD thesis, there was a book designed for bottle collectors, but really not a comprehensive history of the brewing industry that really made it come alive. So, you know, I casually mentioned to some friends that maybe someday I'd write that book. And eventually they kept asking me how the book was going. So I was at that point trapped. And I was very lucky to fall in with the University of Minnesota Press early on. And they had a lot of faith in me as a first time author. And they did a great job of producing the book. And I would also like to thank at this point, my photographer, Bob Foch, whose work you're going to see in so many of the artifact pictures coming up. I'm well aware that when people pick up the book on a shelf, they don't open and say, wow, look at these detailed end notes. They're very informative or beautiful use of the semicolon in this paragraph they pick it up and they say, wow, look at all these great photos of old beer stuff. And Bob was 
great with that. And he also continued to work with me on the Wisconsin book as well. So I'm very grateful to him. He started as an acquaintance, became a friend as we drove all over the upper Midwest. So this was really the inspiration for it. I spent a lot of time working in newspapers and census records and tax records in all sorts of primary source records wherever I could find them because the secondary sources tended to disagree with each other quite a bit. So I found them unreliable. So this has been a constant struggle for many of us who are working on brewery history. Can we get to the primary sources um, and what can we trust? So that was the inspiration. That was a little bit of the method. And I'd like to introduce the state now with a map. And this is the map that is in my book showing all of the breweries that had at some point in Minnesota it existed up to 2007. I really should do a new map with additional colors showing all of the cities that since 2008 have had a brewery that never had one before. And there are many, it's probably 20 or 30 new cities that have had breweries since the birth of the craft movement. So one of the things you will notice as we look at this map is there's a heavy concentration of breweries in the southeastern corner and almost nothing in the northwestern corner. Some of that is a function of population. Some of it is who the people were. The Germans tended to settle much more heavily in the southeastern corner and the Norwegians and Swedes, many of whom were temperance people, tended to settle farther to the west. So the other factor in why there were so many breweries in the southeastern corner is because when that was settled, the railroads had not developed yet. And there was a need for many more brewers there because it was much more difficult to ship the beer any sort of distance at that time. Another thing that really makes Minnesota typical is the chronological distribution of the breweries. And you'll notice my hastily drawn arrow, which depending on what time of day it is may still be inaccurate. But Minnesota's first commercial brewery started in 1849. The growth was rapid with many family firms starting up, especially in the years after the Civil War. There was a period of contraction consolidation, some of which we'll talk about as we go through the talk in more detail. And of course, in 1920, all brewing, all legal brewing ceased. When Minnesota started up again, there were 24 breweries operating, and that number continued to decrease slowly until 1980, 1975, when there were only four breweries left in the state. You can see it starting to tick up again in the 1980s slowly, a little growth, a little contraction, and were I able to extend the arrow, Minnesota's current total of breweries is right around 200. Minnesota's number of breweries was never the biggest in the country, it was typically somewhere between 8th and 12th. Our production level was also somewhere in that same range, typically 8th to 12th. We were a mid-sized producer. Many of the early breweries depended on the geography for their location. We can see Gottlieb Glick's Mississippi Brewery here built on a Mississippi River bluff so that it would be easier for them to dig caves into the limestone for the caves necessary to lager their beer. There were also wells nearby. They did not use river water for their brewing. Much of Minnesota's attraction for brewers was in fact the water. And our water passes through limestone and sandstone so it picks up many of the necessary minerals first to have good tasting water but also water that's easy to brew with because it interacts well with the other ingredients and this fountain was an existing fountain 
near the Roths Keller for the old Minneapolis Brewing Company Grain Belt Brewing. The building behind still exists and is now a small public library. The brewery itself behind the fountain has been converted to an architectural firm's headquarters. So water was a big advantage for Minnesota in attracting brewers and helping them to make good beer. Minnesota also rests right in the heart of the grain belt. And you may have observed that this was the label, which was in fact used by the designers for the cover of my book. Minnesota is a great place to grow barley. It is relatively cool. It's somewhat arid. Barley grows in many regions of the state. And Minnesota also became one of the nation's centers of commercial malting. And in fact, RAR malting, which by some measures is one of the largest maltings in the world, is today headquartered in Shakopee, Minnesota, just outside the Twin Cities, though it started in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, on the shores of Lake Michigan. Minnesota is not as famed as a hop growing region, though there were some hops grown prior to the blight sweeping the upper Midwest in the 1870s. Some Minnesota hops were shipped as far away as St. Louis, but many of them were used locally. We have a professor and scientist at the University of Minnesota at Agricultural School who's been doing a lot of work on trying to track down what varieties were native to Minnesota at the time and what varieties may have been brought in. As I mentioned earlier, the caves, the limestone geology of this state, made it much easier to dig the caves necessary for brewing and storing lager beer. And this is a photo, it's not the greatest, but it's one I took on a legal tour of the former Schmidt Brewery caves. I was with the guy that had the key. There are other ways of getting into these caves that involve dropping through manholes, and I preferred the other version because you didn't have to shimmy your way down a concrete culvert. But the Schmidt Brewery was not even one of the first, though it was one of the first to have any significant development. The earliest Minnesota breweries were all founded before Minnesota was a state. The credit for being the first was Anthony Yerg, who set up, for those of you with any familiarity with St. Paul, approximately where the Excel Center Arena and the Science Museum of Minnesota are today. He was followed quickly by Anth or John Orth, who moved into St. Anthony, which would later become part of Minneapolis. And it is his brewery that became the Grain Belt Brewery that we saw mentioned earlier. Norbert Kimmick started in Stillwater, we believe in 1851. It might have been 1850, but he was there before the newspapers were, so we don't have as much data on him. Stillwater is a city right on the St. Croix River, which is our border with Wisconsin at that point. Jakob Schmall was the first one to move out to the west, and he settled at Traverse de Sioux, which is modern day St. Peter, Minnesota, which is roughly in the you know, center of the southern third of the state. The Loose Bush Brewery was started in 1857 at Duluth at the tip of Lake Superior. Kramer and Seeberger were in the middle of the state and there were about 30 open by the time Minnesota was a state officially in 1858. The vast majority of the labor was provided by German settlers, and there was some early tension between the Germans and the Yankee Presbyterian New Englanders who were in charge of much of the infrastructure and the business of the area. So they, the Yankees owned the newspapers and a lot of the mercantile establishments and believed that Sundays were suited best for going to church. The Germans believed that Sunday was their day of rest and should be spent with friends, family, and some kegs of beer. 
when I was first starting this research, I really wasn't sure what I'd find for beer variety in Minnesota in the earlier days. I figured there would probably just be lager and maybe an occasional ale. And while that was the case for many breweries, there was much more variety than I had expected. And this ad from 1864 shows that Bush's Brewery in Duluth already had five different beers available on a regular basis. And it's interesting to speculate whether these beers would have been the type of thing that we would use these names for now. You know, was a wheat beer what we would today recognize as a vice beer? Would a stock ale have been similar to a pale ale or an IPA? Um, cream ale, was it the style of cream ale or was it just a slightly creamier ale? The present use ale was probably a small beer. And of course, they made their popular lager beer. Minnesota in its early years didn't have a lot of innovative beer styles. In some of the breweries in the English settlements, you could occasionally find an IPA or a Scottish ale. The one that I think was most fascinating was the short-lived Imperial Brewery located in Minneapolis, which for a few years at the turn of the 20th century offered a bottle-conditioned pale ale, something along the lines of Worthington's White Shield or the other great bottle-conditioned ales of the world. Were this being manufactured today, there would be lines around the block waiting to buy it when it was due. But Minnesotans in 1901 and 02 really had no idea what to do with a bottle conditioned ale. It sold poorly and it was discontinued within a matter of a couple of years. The vast majority of Minnesota's early brewers were simply family operations. And the reason I picked Chris Schmitz in particular is it has what I think is perhaps the most creative logo I've seen on any of these 1890s glasses because he was in the city of Belle Plaine, Minnesota. The logo was a bell and a wood plane. So many of them were small businesses, family oriented, often just the family member, maybe a cousin, maybe a couple of hired hands. In a couple of cases, you had the family branching out in the early days of bottled beer, when you were not allowed to brew at, and bottle in the same building, the Norenberg family split up and F.D. Norenberg ran the brewery and his brother A.J. ran the bottling house, which you can see is a tiny building located across the road from the brewery as was required by law at that time. So many of these family businesses fell victim to the same things that any kind of family business does. Sometimes the owner did not have anyone to pass the brewery on to. Sometimes it was just time to retire and they would put the brewery up for sale and try and get whatever they could for it. Some of the brewers were more fortunate and they had sons that wanted to continue in the business or sometimes they had daughters that they were able to marry off either to a brewmaster or an accountant, or in the case of one brewery in Rochester, Minnesota, one daughter each to a brewer and an accountant, thereby securing the future of the business for several generations. One of the other problems though they had was the increasing level of competition. And this was a trip especially true as the Tide House saloons continued to increase in number. And as with most American cities of this time, you could see different breweries tied houses along any major street in the downtown areas. These happen to be in downtown Minneapolis on 2nd Avenue right around 1910. And yes, the Purity Brewing Company was named in perhaps an overabundance of caution after the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed in 1906. Our beer must be pure, it's right there in the name. Of course, competition wasn't just with each other. There was also competition 
from our neighbors to the east. And Schlitz, Pabst, Heilemann, Gund, Michael, Miller, Blatt, I, did I mention Blatt's already, um, all had agents in Minnesota, even some other smaller ones did. So this is a sample of a Schlitz stock label in which the local bottler could print his name at the bottom. And again, St. Cloud, Minnesota is right in the center of the state. But at the time, St. Cloud actually had three breweries of its own. So the Schlitz name and obviously the size of its plant were fierce competition for Minnesota brewers. One of the things where Minnesota really didn't follow the national trends as much was in the massive mergers that happened in the 1890s. For a city like Baltimore or Pittsburgh, there were mergers sometimes of 12 to 18 breweries all combining into something like Pittsburgh Brewing Company. But there was really only one merger in Minnesota history, and that was with four breweries, the Orth Brewery, mentioned as the first in the city, the Miller and Heinrich Brewery, which is in the upper right, the Norenberg Brewery in the lower left, and the Germania Brewery. These four combined to become the Minneapolis Brewing and Malting Company, which later shortened its name to the Minneapolis Brewing Company, but it was much, much better known by the name of its flagship beer, Grain Belt, though it didn't actually change its name to Grain Belt Brewing until the 1960s. As the brewers are, breweries are getting bigger, their business is also becoming more specialized, and so is their workforce. This is a stunning picture from 1885, unless they were trying to trick future generations of historians with the chalk on the bat. And these are the workers at the August Shell Brewing Company in New Ulm, Minnesota, in the southwestern part of the state. And here we see them all posed with their tools, and we can make at least some deductions as to what they did. The gentleman with the shovel and probably the one with the broom most likely worked in the malt house. It would appear that the person working on top of the vat, where he appears to be about to club one of his compatriots with the spigot, but, and the vat youth crawling out of it probably worked in the cellars, the teamster holding his horse, which has been very poorly doctored there. Um, some other unidentified personnel off to our left and sitting in the balcony at the top was the patriarch of the company, August Shell. And for those unfamiliar with the Minnesota brewing industry, the August Shell Brewery still exists today in New Ulm. It is still using some of the buildings in this photograph, and it is the second oldest continuously operated family-owned brewing company in the nation after the Yingling Company of Pennsylvania. So, the labor is becoming more specialized. The labor in some cases is becoming unionized as well. And this was the 18, uh, we believe late 1890s picture of the workers of the Grain Belt Brewing Company, the Minneapolis Brewing Company. I'm sorry, it's 1901, the date is in the back. And the Minneapolis, and St. Paul labor unions were not particularly militant as opposed to, say, those in Chicago. In fact, one of the St. Paul locals actually elected as their president Theodore Ham, who was the owner of the brewery. Clearly, these men had not understood the idea of the adversarial negotiations with labor unions. But in general, there were relatively few strikes. Though one of the strikes was at the Minneapolis Brewing Company, and it was by the women who worked in their bottling house. And some of them we can see here. The women were mostly in charge of labeling and wrapping the bottles for packaging. And they struck in 1903, hoping to get an increase in their wages 
from 90 cents a day to $1 a day. And I wasn't able to ever find an article that actually said how the strike turned out, but I suspect that they did not get that. It was also noted in one of the articles that the average girl in her working day would either label or wrap somewhere around 30,000 bottles. So that is an incredible pace to keep up for any working day. Minnesota's breweries did get bigger in order to compete with some of the competition from abroad. And like many of the other breweries around the nation, the Minnesotans who could afford it hired the great brewery architects of the nation to come in and help design their new breweries. The Schmidt Brewing Company is pictured here in the early 1900s. And many of these buildings still exist. They have been reconverted into a number of purposes, but one of them is a shopping mall where there is a small microbrewery. The breweries in smaller towns were also able to do similar things. Winona, which is a small city on the Mississippi River, almost to the Iowa border, was able to afford Chicago brewery architect Richard Greaser, who came in and designed their new brewery. Unfortunately, it only produced for about 15 years before Prohibition hit, though much of this building also is still in existence. These breweries were able to produce bottled beer inexpensively. And also, this is another area where you can see the competition again. These cases and bottles were all taken from a small store in Minnesota that closed and all of its contents were preserved. And it is today a state historic site. And even a look at this setting can see at least six different breweries, beers, and products, several from Wisconsin, several from Minnesota. And it's giving us the idea that the customer is starting to have more choices available to them. Minnesota was also on the forefront of some of the improvements in bottle technology, or at least adapting them as quick as possible. We see the full range of bottles from the late 1800s here, from a couple of different types of swing tops to a bottle finished with cork to a bottle, the center one, that was fitted for a Baltimore loop seal, which is very similar to a rug rubber drain plug. It even had a little ring that could be pulled out with a special tool. All of these innovations in packaging and shipping and marketing we're going to be running up, however, against one of the other big trends of the time, and that was the increase in temperance sentiment. And here, Minnesota was, again, exemplary in two different ways. It had a very strong tradition of drinking and alcohol-making citizens, but it also had a very strong progressive political tradition. And at that particular time, one of the things the progressives were working on was perfecting society through legislation. And one of the most important ways was to pass prohibition legislation. So Minnesota had a prohibitionist party. They actually ran people for office occasionally, but they didn't win very often because the third party candidates seldom did. The first big turning point for the prohibition movement in Minnesota was really when it became nationalized. And students of politics often list the American Saloon League as one of the very first modern national lobbying organizations. They didn't really care what you did personally. They didn't care what your political party was. But if you were willing to vote for prohibition, they would contribute money to you, they would write letters against your opponent, and in general, advance their causes. So on the national level, prohibition started to move fairly quickly in the 19 teens. But the real turning point and the final nail in the coffin was when the United States entered World War I against Germany. 
And there were several arguments that could be made as to why brewing should stop. One of them was this resource argument. The food aspect here of barley, of course, was it was really needed more for animal feed rather than barley in and of itself. Beer is incredibly fuel intensive to make, and those men probably should be in a trench somewhere rather than working in a brewery. Of course, the other big problem was in the upper Midwest, especially, the vast, vast majority of the brewers were Germans. And if you were buying beer, you were giving your money to Germans, and the allegation was they were sending it straight back to the Kaiser to buy the bullets that were going to kill your sons. And, you know, I have actually seen it said almost that bluntly a few times. So the breweries were forced to go through several steps of prohibition. And many of them closed outright or converted their buildings to other uses if they could. About two dozen tried to have some other products available. The Fitgers Brewery in Duluth tried a number of different beverages, attempting to use their existing bottling equipment, using their existing distribution channels and their know-how. And other breweries tried to do similar things but there were a few, of course, that were continuing to brew illegally. Making near beer, of course, requires you to make f beer first and then de-alcoholize it. And if you happen to skip that step, it was possible to make and ship a fair amount of real beer. The city of St. Paul, in fact, was one of the centers of bootlegging, and it was also known as a resort for the Chicago organized crime families of that era who were essentially told that St. Paul would be a safe city for them as long as they didn't commit any crimes up here. That period being dry and not quite as much fun to drink through, I'm going to move on fairly quickly and get back to the era of repeal. In Minnesota, there were nine breweries of the 22 that would shortly open that were ready to go on April 7th, 1933. They had been brewing for several months, so the beer had a chance to lager. The trucks were ready to go. These happened to me at the Schmidt Brewery in St. Paul. And there was a lot of enthusiasm at that time. There were new investors that were being pulled into the business. And some of that enthusiasm was justified because we had what was really the, one of the most important economic stimulus programs of the New Deal era. Bringing beer back not only brought brewers back, but drivers and carpenters and coopers and electricians and plumbers and people to run the taverns and people to make furniture for the taverns. And the various organizations estimated that there were millions and millions of dollars of ripple effects through the economy just by bringing back beer. There was another innovation shortly after that Minnesota was quick to adopt, and that was the development of the beer can. It was first used by the Kruger Brewing Company of New Jersey in 1935, and they did it in a test market of Richmond, Virginia, just in case it didn't work. It worked brilliantly. It was adopted quickly by breweries across the country, and the breweries in Minnesota, Schmidt, Hams, Grain Belt, and Fitgers were among the first dozen or so to adopt the new cans. You can see a really interesting evolution, if you will, of the Grain Belt can design here, where it starts with the red diamond, which is maintained throughout, and its surroundings continue to change with the times. The cone top cans you see for most of the first six here were beneficial to breweries on a somewhat limited equipment budget because you could fill them with slight adjustments on your existing bottling lines. If you could afford it though, switching over to the flat top right away would be better because they filled faster the cans themselves were cheaper, 
but you would have to buy all new equipment. And as I'm sure many of you know, in the early days of this, they had to explain to people how to get into the can. And so these are the cans beloved by collectors as the OI or opening instructions cans. You also notice on this one that they only recommended opening one hole. They will discover later that it's helpful if you open two holes on a can to let air get out or let air get in and push the beer out. So the breweries were in pretty good shape by the time World War II came around, <coughs> excuse me, and they were preparing for another burst of prohibition sentiment, but the breweries in general got on the side of the war effort. They conserved materials, they promoted propaganda posters like this one. And where they could, they also conserved materials. And while there is some dispute, about who actually invented it. The Glick Brewing Company was the first brewery to actually patent a beer called a malt liquor. And this was a much stronger beer because it was, they were using essentially anything they could get to ferment. And it came in at about 6.8%, which made it a serious headache beer. And with these bright green cans, it was known locally as Green Death. Glick also had another innovation right after the war where they were using a, an early version of a process that we would today call irradiation. Though I'm not sure that in the early days of the nuclear era, claiming your beer was protected by killing ray sterile lamps was necessarily the most appetizing sales pitch. What would be a good appetizing sales pitch is just to present your beer as absolutely refreshing. And the period after World War II is when you have almost no difference between the brands of beer and the contents of the bottle. A refreshing glass of beer goes with yard cleaning. There was really no attempt to talk about the ingredients of the beer you know, except for a few breweries that talked about just using a few hops. Schlitz in particular just had the kiss of the hops. So beer was really just marketed as refreshment and with that also sometimes just on price. By the 1950s and 60s we were left with just a very few breweries in the state and they were declining all the time. Those that survived needed to advertise heavily and of course this brings us to the Ham's Bear. I couldn't talk about Minnesota brewing without mentioning it at least once. And the hams campaigns were designed in the late 1950s. They became especially popular in the 60s and 70s. And it is one of the ways that you can tell if somebody of my vintage is really from Minnesota. Because if you sing to them, from the land of sky blue waters, and they do not respond with, waters, you know they're faking it. Though Hams at this point was a national brand. It was the fifth largest in the country. It was being advertised heavily on the West Coast. And I have actually seen Spanish language ads for Hams that were used in the California market. Breweries that couldn't afford to advertise quite like Hams did so with their colorful packaging. And it's, at least in the upper Midwest, it's likely that 90% of the beer can collections that got started in the 1970s started with kids trying to collect all the Schmidt Scenic cans. This wasn't enough to keep most breweries around though, and the consolidation took several breweries away, like the Glick Brewing Company, and again by 1975 we were down to four breweries. It stayed that way for a while. But in 1985, two things happened. The August Shell Brewery started discovering some of their old recipes and bringing them back. And we had the first new craft breweries, or micros as they were called at the time, Summit Brewing Company in St. Paul, second from right, and the James Page Brewing Company, second from left. Some of these breweries also started making contract beers, 
and Shells in New Ulm was the first brewery to make Pete's Wicked Ale, which became a huge beer in many states during the 1980s and 90s. Minnesota's beers gained some recognition. This is the then very young head brewer and owner of Summit Brewing in St. Paul, Mark Stutrud, with the eminent beer writer, Michael Jackson. May he rest in peace. Summit today has expanded to a large corporate section in St. Paul. And in fact, it's even bigger than this photo would indicate because they have since acquired another brewery for their canning line. But Minnesota's development was also aided by a number of breweries who were much smaller and or at least at the start. This was the Surly Brewing Company when then head brewer Todd was also head welder Todd and they were just starting to get this ready. The brew pubs also started to come around in Minnesota in the 1990s and with that yet another form of packaging, the growler. Since then there this is about where the book ended, but several things have happened in Minnesota since then that I just wanted to add on here quickly. We've had several new breweries. Okay, we've had 180 new breweries come online since my book came out. And some of them were so important that they resulted in le legislation changes. In order to create their destination brewery, Surly had to get several pieces of legislation passed so they could have a restaurant in a production brewery as opposed to simply being a brew pub. Another important development is the movement of great beer to what we call greater Minnesota, the area outside the Twin Cities. And for me, this came full circle when Junkyard Brewery opened up in Moorhead, Minnesota, where my entire project started, and they have become well-known locally for some very innovative, hoppy, sour, and barrel-aged beers. Several Minnesota breweries have done other great things with innovation. This is Bang Brewing Company, which is Minnesota's first all-organic brewery, and it is located entirely within this silo. If we go just around the corner to the left, you can see an older building there. And that is Urban Growler Brewing Company, which is the first all-female owned brewery in the state of Minnesota. We have several breweries that have excellent barrel aging programs. We have breweries that are working with wild yeasts and aging their beer in fitters. And I've been trying to keep up with the Minnesota scene as well as I could with that kind of expansion has become very difficult, partially also because I've spent the last 11 years working on this book as well, The Drink That Made Wisconsin Famous. And I, my line when this came out last fall was that it took me longer to do this than it took the United States to get Apollo to the moon, and I had a better computer. But with that, that's where this official tour of Minnesota's brewing history ends. We have looked at an awful lot of the history. I'd be happy to answer your question, but I bet perhaps like, like me at this point, you could perhaps go for a beer. Doug, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I know there's a couple of questions and for those of you watching live on Facebook, please feel free to ask your questions in the comment section. Uh, folks here on Zoom, please ask via the chat room. And the first question is from Carrie. What was the reason for separating breweries from bottling businesses in the 1800s? Um, the reason for that was simply a matter of law. The beer was all taxed by the barrel. And up in, from 1862, when the excise tax started, until 1890 when lobbying by major brewers was able to get some rationale to this, all beer first had to be put into barrels, even if it was going to be put into bottles. And in order to make sure there were no shortcuts, the, bottle, the bottling house had to be across a public road 
so that the revenue agents could be absolutely sure that the beer was in a barrel first. So it was mostly just a, a, an attempt by the government to make sure that nobody evaded the taxes, but it still happened. So out of that meaty uh, discussion, uh, all the information you just shared for the last 50 or so minutes, how sick of you of people asking you immediately about the hams bear? <laughs> um, not very. It was, really? it was pretty famous. And one of the things that I learned early on was it was not necessarily automatically associated with Minnesota. Right. In the early days of my research, I was visiting a former student and friend down in Chicago who was in court at the time working in the court, not part of the criminal justice feeder system. And he introduced me to, I think, his boss, who was one of the top federal prosecutors in the area at the time. And we were talking about the book and he said, well, why are you writing about hams? That's a Wisconsin beer. Yeah. So as popular as the ads were, they didn't necessarily help hams survive as a company. I will just add that I have brought out one of my archival glasses from the 1950s for this. Nice. You know, I, that's, that's interesting that you say that because even here in Chicago, um, people Im immediately think that hams was from Wisconsin. But I also, you know, I, I kind of equate hams to old style in that people in Chicago think that it's a Chicago beer because it was so heavily marketed here, whereas it was actually brewed in Northern Wisconsin. So there's an interesting sort of, um, I, I, I don't know if it's because we all immediately think of in the Midwest, uh, these, these macro brands as all being uh, anchored in Wisconsin. Right, I think that's probably the case. And I think that, you know, if you're in a tavern somewhere in Chicago, you know, you're just looking at the lighted signs around you and looking at the trees, um, you know, and I think a large majority of the was the Chicago cabin owning population yeah. had Wisconsin cabins too. So when they yeah. saw the trees, they associated it with Rhinelander or something like that rather than the North Woods of Minnesota. Yeah, those, um, those iconic uh, neon lit tavern old style signs are certainly, I think, what gave um, old style its big boost here in Chicago and the surrounding area, would you say that the the ham bear in the uh, commercials did the same? Did it really um, boost sales? I would say actually that hams made most of its penetration into Chicago before the bear, and it was by heavy sports advertising. So for a while, hams was sponsoring both the White Sox and the Cubs, and you know, that's going to reach an awful lot of listeners. And they had a lot of sports paraphernalia, Bruriana as well. They had, yeah. you know, clocks you could put in your bar with the little chalkboard that you could, you know, write the line score inning by inning for the baseball game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for sure, old style, when they got into Wrigley Field, same, same deal. But, um, you know, those, the, all of the sort of the, the clock, old 70s clocks with the animated uh, water and things with the bear are certainly still a, a major collector's item. They are. And the picture that you used for the website to promote the talk was one of the slightly earlier generations of those. But the next generation, the Cineramas, if they are in pristine condition and still working, um, you can find them at a lot of Bruriana shows and occasionally other antique sales and flea markets, but it'll probably set you back twelve to fifteen hundred bucks. Wow, that's that's quite so. A bit. If you if you value your man cave, it's a good investment. <laughs> um, Brian wants to know what was the historic site you referred to earlier uh, in reference to the store or brewery that closed but had all the bottles oh. left inside. Yes, that was the historic Forestville store, which is in far southeastern Minnesota. It could be found on the Minnesota Historical Society website, or I can perhaps pull up a link to it. But 
it was one of those ones where the store closed, everybody moved away and everything was pretty much just left in C2 for <laughs> decades. That's cool. Um, all right, anybody have any other questions for Doug? Please ask away. Um, we'll just get in a plug for what I'm drinking in my hams glass, if I may. Absolutely. Um, it is probably the, the light colored beer in my house least like hams. Um, it is ale from the Old Vale, which was by the Ovalde Brewing Company, which is an, a classic throwback farm brewery. It's actually on Joe Pond's family's farm. He does his brewing in the barn. He uses lots of um, botanicals. He uses lots of wild yeast and has a lot of really great beers of interesting character. And um, you'll know him if you're at a Minnesota Beer Fest because he's probably the only one who's going to be there in the later hosen. <laughs> Come on. Are not more later hosen in Minnesota? You, you would think there would be more. <laughs> um, and where is it? Where is that brewery? It is in Rolling Stone, Minnesota, which is just to the west of Winona. I so mean, if you going there for the name of the town alone is worth it. Right. Um, of course, it's for the mill Rolling Stone as opposed to either the Dillon version or the Rolling Stones version. <laughs> but if you head north and west on US 14, you will eventually go through Winona and then straight through Rolling Stone. Right on. All right. Well, I'll look up for it next time I'm in Minnesota. Um, Doug, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, always a treat to hear from other beer historians, and I appreciate your support of the Bruseum. Um, Maybe we can convince you to do a talk on Wisconsin beer history. Um, I, I've got a couple pretty much ready to go. I would be happy to do it. Awesome. Awesome. It would be even more fun to do one when I can actually come down there and be with you all. Oh my gosh, doing it in person? I can't imagine. I, I kind of remember what that's like. Yeah, I, know. I know. Well, we'll get back to it. Um, I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us again. Uh, Chicagobruseum.org for everything we're up to and more events. We have a lot of events coming up. Um, they're just not on our website yet, so just keep checking. Um, make sure you subscribe to the newsletter. Donate if you can. All of this content has been yours free. Um, because it should be accessible to all. And speaking of everything we've done, most everything we've done uh, for these past three months is now available on the newly debuted uh, Chicago Museum YouTube channel. I know, we're getting fancy. Yay. Um, so head on over to YouTube to catch some of the past presentations. Otherwise, we'll continue to do them here on Zoom and Facebook Live and upload them to our channel. Um, but with that, I thank you all again for coming and we'll catch you next time. Everyone have a great evening. Thanks again for coming and thanks for inviting me.